Uh, James is currently the visiting fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe and the Project on International Order and Strategy uh, at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's widely published in elite venues, including the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, commentary, um, and international publications. Um, he has an excellent new book out called The End of Europe, Dictators, Demagogues, and the Current Dark Age, uh, which Yale University Press has published. Uh, Jim is a graduate of Yale, uh, majoring in history um, and political science. Uh, James is also uh, currently working on a history of uh, the gay community in Washington, D.C. Um, he is the recipient of the National Lesbian and Gay Journalist Association um, Award. Uh, he's spoken um, in many venues um, around the world, but most important, the greatest thing for my appreciation of his credibility, he was born in the great city of Boston. <laughs> And he's a graduate of Roxbury Latin. My mother uh, grew up in Roxbury. I was born there. She's a graduate of the Jeremiah Burke School. So if nothing else, even if I disagree with every word he says tonight, and I won't, uh, the fact that he's a fellow Bostonian enlightening you tonight certainly uh, brings warm glow to my heart. A few days after I wore my Tom Brady shirt to class to rub in the futility of your local football team. Uh, without further ado, please welcome James Kirser. Give him a good hand. Thank you, Professor Kaufman. And not only are we Bostonians, but we are members of that lucky tribe of Bostonians who don't have a Boston accent, uh, which is an incredibly uh, lucky community to be a part of. Um, thank you all for coming tonight in this warm uh, invitation. Uh, a specter is haunting Europe, a, the specter of populist nationalism. Ideologically indeterminate, it manifests across the continent in the form of France's right-wing National Front, the post-communist German Left Party, and the Italian Five Star Movement, which is led by a comedian and defies any customary political label. While these parties and the intellectual currents to which they give voice may not align on everything, they are invariably anti-establishment, skeptical of the European Union, and hostile to America. They are also all supported, either materially or through other less tangible means, by Russia. This is not incidental. As Europe's political stability, social cohesion, economic prosperity, and security are more threatened today than at any point since the Cold War, Russia is destabilizing the continent on every front. Indigenous factors, like nationalism or design flaws in the Eurozone, the lack of a common foreign policy, or the inability to assimilate immigrants, certainly lay at the root of all of these crises. But all of these crises are exploited by Moscow and exacerbated by its malign influence. Fomenting European disintegration from within, Russia also presents a threat from without in the form of its massive military buildup, its frequent intimidation of NATO members, and its efforts to overturn the continent's security architecture by weakening the transatlantic link with America. Yet just at the moment when the West requires unity, it is disintegrating. Brexit foretells the potential demise of the European Union, which has been a democratic bulwark to Russia's predatory strategy of divide and conquer. <clears throat> Meanwhile, on this side of the Atlantic, Americans have chosen a president who abjures his country's traditional role as the linchpin of the liberal world order and who wishes to ally with the very power threatening to dismantle it. Unlike any president of the post-war age, Donald Trump's 19th century worldview seems to accord with a Russian sphere of interest in Europe. Now, the title of my book references not the dissolution of the European Union or something so catastrophic as a conventional war, though these are real, if remote, possibilities, but rather something more ethereal and imaginable. That is the slow, gradual reversion to the European state of nature prior to the post-war integration project, 
in the rise of amoral, prostrate, nationalist governments that no longer project the liberal values upon which the Euro-Atlantic community is grounded and that are willing to engage in a purely transactional relationship with Moscow. Should the end of Europe that I presage come to pass, it will be the fault of apathetic Europeans, absent Americans, and aggressive Russians. Since the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989, we've had four basic assumptions about Europe. And these assumptions have pertained to the broader Western world. The first is that liberal democracy would be the final stage of human political development, the so-called end of history thesis for, uh, popularized by Francis Fukuyama. The second consensus uh, was one that had developed around regulated free market capitalism as being the best way of organizing our economies. The um, third uh, uh, assumption was that Europe would integrate and the world would integrate, but as we see with Brexit, with the Scottish independent movement, and most recently um, in Catalonia, it appears that we are actually disintegrating, not, not integrating. And finally, the fourth assumption that we had was that Europe would forever be a place of perpetual peace, a security exporter that would project stability uh, into its neighborhood. Now, I'd say all three, or all four, excuse me, of these assumptions are being challenged. And in some places, they're actually being overturned. To begin with democracy, we see in Hungary, a member in good standing of the European Union, a twice elected prime minister openly calls for illiberal democracy. And he cites Turkey, Russia, and China as role models for his country to follow. As for economics, uh, there's been a total and complete backlash to free trade and the free market from the left and the right. Uh, nearly a decade of, of slow growth in Europe since the crash has seen the rise of economic populists who are calling for a return to protectionism and greater state control over the economy. And when it comes to security, a resurgent Russia threatens Europe like no time since the Cold War. Its annexation of Crimea was the first violent land grab on the European continent since World War II. Its massive military expenditures and its constant intimidation of NATO allies demonstrate that the optimistic assertions that we had in the 1990s and the early 2000s about Russia's becoming a responsible member of the West were entirely premature. Meanwhile, massive migratory waves from the Middle East combined with a failure in many places to fully integrate Muslim minorities uh, has contributed to a rise of Islamic terrorism, which is presenting Europe with a new normal in which mass casualty terrorist attacks are becoming routine. Now, unlike during the Cold War, Russia today does not seek the military and political domination of Europe through the advance of the Red Army, uh, the occupation of, of um, you know, Eastern Europe, although obviously Ukraine is an exception to that, or the spread of communist ideology. It's not doing this anymore. It rather wants to reset the continent's security order. And the Kremlin tries to achieve this through meddling in European and American politics so as to bring to power governments that are acquiescent to its primary international objective, which is supplanting the values-driven, rules-based international system upheld by the United States with one uh, that the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, describes as a, quote, post-Western world order, wherein might makes right. In this order, the countries along Russia's periphery will be forced to accept limited sovereignty. Moscow seeks nothing less than a reversal of the momentous historical processes begun in 1989, when Central and Eastern Europeans peacefully reclaimed their freedom after decades of Russian-imposed tyranny. Because the European Union and NATO uh, stand as obstacles in the reassertion of Russian hegemony, uh, Moscow's long-term strategy is to fundamentally undermine and ultimately break these institutions from within, thereby neutralizing the concert of nations that has for centuries traditionally been necessary to restrain Russian expansion on the European continent. The Kremlin's ideal outcome is the Finlandization of the West whereby Europe and America abandon our principles, sacrifice our allies, and accommodate Kremlin prerogatives without Russia having to dispatch a single soldier abroad. In Western Europe today, through hybrid warfare tactics of disinformation, hacking, leaking, and the spread of corruption, Russia hopes to achieve by nonviolent means what the Soviet Union once did in Eastern Europe through force of arms, which is overthrow democratic governments.
Because a West that is divided, inert, and unsure of its own basic values is not one that will resist Russia's new imperial agenda. Across the West, the Russians are pushing on open doors, exploiting fears of Islam, economic inertia, and anxieties wrought by globalization to nudge Western publics in a more Russia-sympathetic direction. Finally attuned to the particular grievances in a diverse array of Western countries, Russian narratives find fertile ground in Europe, where resentment over the Iraq war, fallout from the 2008 financial crisis, fears over the challenges brought by Muslim immigration, and revelations of national security agency surveillance continue to breed discontent with the political mainstream establishment. Now, beginning with President Trump, who to this day apparently continues to deny that the Russians uh, intervened in our own election last year, many Western leaders have difficulty accepting the strategic necessity of treating Moscow like the pariah it is. They labor under the illusion that it's our own hubris, our own arrogant post-Cold War imposition of security and political arrangements on an emasculated and humiliated post-Soviet Russia. They claim that it's these things which are standing in the way of good relations with Moscow and not the Russian regime's revisionism and aggression. This credulity extends, I might add, to members of the previous American administration, many of whose members have suddenly awoken to the paramount threat Russia poses to our security and values. They've rediscovered their inner Scoop Jacksons. Uh, and they are engaging, they are engaging in, a, in a bout of selective amnesia, frankly, regarding the past eight years of the Obama administration's solicitousness to Moscow. Like the titular leader of the free world, a fair number of European elites <clears throat> stuck in a mindset that still considers Russia a potential partner, bend over backwards to explain Russian conduct as the predictable and not entirely unjustified reaction of an encircled power whose interests must be respected. They tell us that we need to bend the rules of the international liberal order to the claims of a revisionist power that wants to overturn that order completely. So to paraphrase Leon Trotsky, the West may not seek conflict with Russia, but Russia seeks conflict with the West. That is because the Putin regime cannot coexist alongside a democratic Europe willing to stand for its principles and willing to extend those principles and values into the former Soviet space. Moscow sees liberal democracy as a threat and therefore must defeat it, undermine it, either by force of arms in Ukraine and an attempted coup in Montenegro, or through nonviolent means in the West, dragging us down to their level through the export of kleptocracy, corruption, disinformation, and support for nationalist and disruptive political movements and social forces. And one particularly egregious example of this, you might have heard of the uh, Cal Exit movement, which is a tiny little obscure movement in California to you know, leave the United States and become an independent country. Guess where the uh, director, the founding director of that movement lives? He lives in Yekaterinburg, Russia. Oh, no. Now you might be wondering, why would the Russians be involved you know, in, in something so crazy and harebrained a scheme as a, a California independence movement? The answer to that question is why not? It costs them nothing and it causes trouble for us. And if you look at what they've been doing over the past, if you look at all these recent stories over the past couple of weeks about what they were doing on Facebook and Twitter and what they continue to do, uh, they support everyone from, you know, LGBT, LGBT activists and environmentalists on the left to, you know, extreme right neo-Nazis on the right. That's, that's their, modus, their modus operandi. So shorn of, you know, Marxist Leninism, the Kremlin today is driven by an ideologically versatile or promiscuous illiberalism that's willing to work with any potential faction amenable to its aims. So whereas once Moscow allied with local communists and fellow travelers, now it also counts upon a growing number of sympathizers on the right. Russia has reverted to its czarist place, you could say, um, in the words of the writer Paul Berman, as the historical center of world reaction. It is headquarters of the new counter-enlightenment. Now, the avatar of the Kremlin-friendly conservative leader in Europe today is the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who over the last quarter century has undergone one of the more remarkable transformations in European politics from that of a liberal anti-communist firebrand to Vladimir Putin's closest ally in the EU. Despite being the leader of a proud nation that was brutally invaded and occupied by the Soviet Union, 
Orban, Orban is the most vocal internal opponent of EU sanctions placed on Russia over its meddling in Ukraine, which is a neighbor of Hungary. Orban also aligns with the Kremlin on a more profound level, championing what he calls illiberal democracy, and most recently, ethnic homogeneity, as well as echoing Russian promulgated narratives on Western decline and the threat posed to Europe from an undifferentiated uh, Islamic peril. The embrace of Putin by Western leaders like Trump, Orban, and Marine Le Pen is the culmination of a years-long uh, cultivation of the global right by Russia. Now, one of, the more, uh, the, one of the most potent narratives that Russia has that it's weaponized in this regard is that of a Judeo-Christian civilization that's under siege from a rising Islamic threat. As fears of demographic and societal change have taken hold in parts of Europe, that are traditionally most resistant to Russian meddling, like the countries that used to be occupied by Russia. Russia has subtly insinuated itself into the politics there to an extent unprecedented since the collapse of the Soviet Union, finding allies in the unlikeliest of places. Now that the issue of Islam in Europe has been exploited by Russia should not prevent us from having an honest conversation about the challenges uh, posed by this, which all too many European elites tend to do. A recent poll commissioned by Chatham House, the British think tank, found that over half of respondents in eight out of 10 European countries favor an outright ban on immigration from Muslim countries, which is the same exact position that Donald Trump took during his campaign. Now this shocking figure demonstrates a massive gap between the lofty language and, and policies of European elites and the average people that they are elected to represent to ensure that this gap does not grow and that the populace espousing such extreme positions do not one day come to power, I believe that the Western political mainstream needs to address these concerns and create the space for an inclusive liberal nationalism that is capable of addressing questions about the place of Islam in European societies so that the cause of national identity is not hijacked by unscrupulous demagogues like the National Front or Geert Wilders in the Netherlands or the alternative for Deutschland, the uh, far right party in Germany. So that, therefore that means that tackling the problem of parallel societies, perhaps banning the full face veil as Chancellor Merkel has suggested or even lowering migration from Muslim majority countries. If the mere discussion of these policies is treated as a concession to fascism, then I'm afraid it is the fascists who will reap the benefits. In response to Brexit, the American election, and the rise of populists across Europe, many in the West are beginning to question the assumptions upon which the post-war liberal order is based. While introspection is necessary, we do not need to rethink our first principles. Protectionism remains wrong, both morally and economically. NATO remains the bedrock of our security, no matter how many times certain individuals call it obsolete. The post-war international system has benefited America enormously. It is not some ripoff. Minister Lavrov's call for a post-Western world order is nothing new. Russian leaders have frequently floated proposals aimed at diluting the Western-led international system. We shouldn't fall for it now. Unfortunately, many of these calls for reassessing America's role in the world and in Europe are finding an audience on this side of the ocean where voices claim that it, that it has outlived uh, its usefulness. In a combination of astonishing historical illiteracy and sinister prophecy, the president's former senior counselor, Stephen Bannon, says that he wants to make the world, and I'm quoting him, as exciting as the 1930s, and that, quote, strong nationalist movements in countries make strong neighbors. I'm not sure what history book of Europe he's read that would lead him to that conclusion. The ineluctable logic of nationalist movements, of course, is that they will inevitably conflict. So you might see Marine Le Pen getting along with other nationalist leaders in Europe right now and standing up against the EU, but the logical conclusion of the policies of these leaders uh, would lead to enmity between them. French industrial policy, which is you know, basically f uh, controlling the economy and directing, um, uh, directing business. Uh, French industrial policy of the sort that's endorsed by Marine Le Pen cannot coexist. It cannot coexist alongside Germany's export-driven economy. 
which in turn, the nationalist alternative for Germany would utterly weaken by removing Germany from the common currency. Um, meanwhile, a leading figure in what passes for the pro-Trump intellectual movement, who now serves as a high-ranking national security official in the administration, asks of NATO, quote, what is the alliance for once its original purpose has evaporated? Now, the original purpose of NATO, according to its uh, first secretary general, was to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. Now, with the exception of that last part about Germany, whose neighbors wanted to play a more assertive role in continental security and defense, the founding rationale for NATO remains. It hasn't really changed in the past 80 years. In, over the course of this time, the transatlantic relationship has been the bedrock of American foreign policy. There's no other group of countries anywhere in the world that more closely shares our values and interests than those of Europe. Presidents of both parties, from Harry Truman to Richard Nixon, from Ronald Reagan to even Barack Obama, all supported a politically and economically integrated Europe bound to the United States by shared democratic values, robust trade, and a military alliance founded upon the principle of collective security. Now, the transatlantic bond has been sustained through two organizations, largely. The European Union, which is the political and economic arm, and then the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is the security arm. By first protecting Western Europe from Soviet aggression, and then after the Cold War ended, by integrating Eastern Europe into its security architecture, NATO is rightly regarded as the most successful military alliance in history. The EU, mean, meanwhile, has benefited America by providing a unified market for our businesses, and it has consolidated the continent's diverse nation states into a fellow democratic geopolitical power. It is no exaggeration to say that the European project has been America's most successful foreign policy achievement, helping to bring about unprecedented peace and prosperity to a continent that was once racked by total war, genocide, and economic privation. In the form of Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine, a massive migrant crisis, stubbornly low economic growth, rising terrorism, political disintegration in the form of Brexit, and the rise of illiberal populist movements across the continent, Europe is facing a series of challenges that collectively pose its greatest crisis in decades. And I'm afraid that the current uh, administration in Washington may aggravate these tensions by destabilizing Europe from within and without. By supporting and lending sort of rhetorical force to Great Britain's departure from the EU and encouraging other states to follow in its lead, Donald Trump's opposition to European integration breaks with over seven decades of U.S. foreign policy. In a recent joint uh, in interview earlier this year with the London Times and Germany's Bild newspaper, Trump disparaged the EU, echo echoing claims that it amounts to other people coming in and destroying their country, in his words. Asked about the future of the EU, Trump responded, I don't really care whether it's separate or together. It doesn't matter. As for NATO, what seems most to annoy Trump is its supposed cost to the American taxpayer. The crux of Donald Trump's complaint, as is the case with his position on nearly every international issue, is that the United States is getting a bad deal out of its membership in NATO. Now, it's true that Washington pays more than its fair share of NATO's overall budget, about 75%, and that the United States is one of only three or four other members to spend <clears throat> the recommended minimum 2% of GDP on defense. Trump acts as if he's the first person to point out these facts. Um, when this is a conundrum that has confronted American defense planners since the NATO treaty was signed 67 years ago. Uh, now, understanding an alliance like NATO solely in monetary terms misses its purpose completely. For example, take Denmark, which like most NATO members does not spend the recommended minimum 2% of its GDP on defense. Yet more Danish soldiers died per capita as part of the NATO mission in Afghanistan, which I'll remind President Trump was undertaken in solidarity with the United States by NATO after terrorist attacks on our country. More Danish soldiers died per capita as part of that mission than any other member of the alliance. Now surely that sacrifice in blood should count for at least as much as expenditures in treasure. Yes, European countries should spend more for their own defense, not merely out of respect for the perpetually put upon American taxpayer, but also for their own good. 
But this obsession with money fails to account for the true value of the Atlantic Alliance, which lies beyond the financial contributions of its members. Today, thanks in, thanks in no small part to the endurance of NATO, Europe is home to countries that both share our democratic values and are some of our biggest trading partners. We take the international system for granted because the advantage, the, its advantages, America's return on investment, as our real estate mogul president might put it, manifests itself in the absence of the political destabilization and armed conflict that plague other parts of the world. And so it's hard to convince people uh, of something when its benefits are not so tangible, they're not so clear. It is the absence of conflict and war uh, that the liberal international order that, that the United States has, has upheld. Those are the benefits that we derive from our uh, investment in it. Uh, alliances with other countries, particularly those in Europe, are a force multiplier for the United States, allowing us to achieve goals that would be much more difficult, if not impossible, to accomplish on our own. Having troops deployed overseas, from Japan to Germany to over 150 countries, this allows us to project our power, to deter adversaries, and it's far less costly and logistically complex than shipping them out every time the US um, uh, is involved in a, in, in a crisis. So to avert catastrophe, it is imperative that the United States pivot back to Europe for all the hype about a rising Asia, Europe is America's most important ally with whom we share values and interests. Abandoning Europe at this time would create a political and security vacuum on the continent, one that would inevitably fill, be filled by Russia. While Russia today may not be nearly as strong a power as it was during the Cold War, the threat that it poses is more diffuse. In a globalized world where the cancerous influence of Russian money and disinformation can more easily corrupt us than when the Iron Curtain divided the continent. Containing Russia presents different challenges than it did a generation ago, not the least of which is maintaining Western unity against a more ambiguous adversary skilled at fighting asymmetrically. Never during the Cold War, for instance, was there such a traumatic break within the Western political alliance as Britain's departure from the European Union, nor for that matter, did an overtly pro-Russian leader ever capture the presidency of the United States. A genuinely democratic Russia would feel no threat from Europe or America, and thus lack the impulse to debase and disrupt it. To be sure, the illiberal movements that are currently roiling the EU, they would exist regardless of Russia. Anyone remotely familiar with the history of the European continent knows that Europeans don't require outside agitation or instigation to support destructive forces like nationalism. But only absent the revisionist and aggressive regime in Moscow is a Europe whole, free, and at peace possible. Thank you, and I will take some questions. Mm -hmm. I can do it. Don't all bite at once. Yes, sir. Given that Russia is a petro state on the order of an economy like Italy, I believe, yeah. uh, do you think the declining demand for oil, which we presume is you know, in the future <coughs> soon, yeah. uh, will, have, will impact them in a way that might change the dynamic of the situation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Russian economy is not modernized. Vladimir Putin has completely failed to modernize his economy. Um, and I think. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on oil projections and, and oil markets and energy consumption, um, but I think, yes, over the long term, this will certainly uh, harm Russia, um, hurt its coffers and its, and its ability to meddle and create and cause problems. You know, that said, we've had almost four years now, three and a half years, of sanctions on Russia over what it's been doing in Ukraine, and, and that hasn't dissuaded it from continuing this war in eastern Ukraine and from launching a real unprecedented attack on American democracy in the form of what it did uh, last year. So, you know, I think the, the issue here is less, I mean, Russia's a weak country in, 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 in objective terms. If the combined military spending of NATO dwarfs Russia. The economies, the economic, the GDP of, of the EU in America dwarfs NATO. I think it is more a question of our own you know, resilience and, and, and um, ability to confront Russia 
That's the problem. We have too many people who are unwilling to use the tools and the power at our disposal. We, tr we treat Russia as a more important and powerful country uh, than it is. And we, and we allow it to do things that it you know, shouldn't be getting away with, with doing. Yes, sir. You talk about uh, Russia's activities with Facebook um, and pitting you know, different groups against one another. If a white American had done that, would that be a crime? Or if they can do it, right. where, where are we going to go at and say that they can't do it? Or can they hire the lobbyists to do it as long as they register? As long as they register, yes. And this is, you know, Paul Manafort's in trouble for this because he didn't register. We just made Russia Today, the cable network, register. Um, you know, all countries try to influence other countries. The United States tries to influence other countries, absolutely. Um, what we need to distinguish, what Russia did last year was they, there's a difference between putting bots on Twitter and creating fake Facebook groups. There's a difference between doing that and breaking the law and, and hacking, uh, stealing information. Well, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Not, not sure. Right. Yes. Oh, they're, yeah, they're absolutely, they're, I mean, there's nothing, I mean, we can try to stop that. We can try to get Facebook and Twitter to crack down on that, and I think we should. Um, there's, I, don't, I don't think there's any legal instrument that we can use, but I think, you know, corporate leaders who are patriotic American citizens should not want their platforms being abused and exploited by hostile adversaries to uh, manipulate or negatively influence um, our electoral process. So I think there should be, you know, social pressure public pressure put on these corporations to exercise better control over their, over their platforms. Yeah. Well, so um, <coughs> even though we're, NATO's way, way stronger than, than Russia in terms of military uh, capability, it seems to me we're losing the cyber war. And um, I mean, it almost looks like we're losing the cyber war to North Korea. Uh, the NSA gets hacked, and, you know, what are we going to do about that? That seems like a very powerful way. It is, although I would say so much of the effect of leaks, which is really what we're, I think, what we're talking about. Well, not necessarily leaks. Stealing uh, information? Yes, yeah, stealing technology, yeah. you know, the technology that we think we need to protect right. ourselves. I'm not an expert on cyber issues cybersecurity, so I can't really comment on that. All I would say is that with um, the, the ability to influence politics through the leaking of information um, can only go so far as our own ability as citizens in a democracy to resist um, or to avoid exploitation. So if the Republicans last summer had followed what Marco Rubio said, which was, I'm not gonna talk about this stuff that WikiLeaks is putting up on the internet because it might be about Democrats today, but it could be about Republicans tomorrow. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna put my, put my country before my party. If more Republicans had behaved that way, then I, you know, we wouldn't be having all these problems now. And I'm not, look, I'm not so sure that the Democrats would have behaved any differently, frankly. I'm not saying, this is not a partisan issue. So I think we need, we need a, a broader understanding, a broader public awareness of the new tools that other countries are using to influence our, our politics, our debate. Um, we need to be more skeptical about news or out, about news outlets. I think we have, to, we, need, we need media literacy. We need, I mean, I think uh, a lot of older people, frankly, who didn't grow up with the internet, no offense to people in this room, <laughs> might, not, might not be able to always tell the difference between a legitimate news article and something that's fake news and wrong. And so we need, we need to do a better job as a society working on this. And then the, imp, the impact of leaks will be much more minimal. I mean, if you go to countries like Estonia and the Baltics, you know, countries that lived under the Soviet Union, they, they, they have a very well-developed you know, bullshit detector, if you will. <laughs> they know, they, 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 they can smell when something is off, when something is not right, when there's an accusation or um, you know, when a particular politician, you know, say, is having information about him leaked or whatnot, they, they know that it's probably coming from uh, a foreign actor. And we need, we need to develop the same skills as a, as a, as a society. Yes? Do you think the young people have a better No, I was going to say the young people uh, have no memory of history, no memory of the Cold War, 
and are oftentimes just, just as illiterate about reading the news because they never grew up with newspapers. They grew up just with the internet. And so they, for different reasons, often don't know how to distinguish between legitimate news outlets and fake ones. Um, and this is what I think the Russians ultimately want. They want to, it's not, what they're doing is not propaganda because it's not extolling Russia as a great society, which is what they did during the Cold War. They were promoting a particular ideology of communism and they were saying, this is the way of the future. They're not doing that anymore. What they're doing is basically saying, well, you know what, you stink too. And everything else stinks. And it's this completely, you know, um, this moral haze where no one is right and everyone's corrupt and there's no difference between liberal democracy and Russian authoritarianism. It's all just a joke and a, and a sham. And that, that is ultimately, I think, the, 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 the Russian narrative that they're promoting and that they're producing. Professor. One, you emphasize Trump as being the discontinuity from previous administrations. I'd contest that. If you look at Obama's reset, uh, starting canceling sure. the missile defense, yeah, yeah. bungling events in Syria, the Poles' reaction that mm -hmm. the... NATO is no longer valuable. Uh, I, I think there's a very good case that this all predates Trump. Two, I, I think you're right about Trump's pre-presidential rhetoric on NATO, yep. which sounds America first. Yep. And although Trump is like eating spam, it's mystery meat, and anything I say would be provisional, you could actually make a case that on Europe in general and uh, NATO, better than one would have expected, maybe even better than Obama. The yeah. speech he gave in Poland was far more robust than one would have expected. Um, thirdly, uh, you seem to associate the EU and NATO as coterminous in terms of democracy. I, I'm not sure about that either. I'm with you on NATO, but there are many anti-democratic tendencies in the EU that Margaret Thatcher and a lot of thoughtful pro-NATO people have pointed sure. out. And then finally, um, Islamic fascism, uh, according to many supporters of NATO, myself included, is indeed a real problem, not just an imaginary phantom. So uh, with all that, uh, fire away and you get the last one. Uh, I agree with you entirely on President Obama. And I wrote actually an article a couple months ago called Why It's Hard to Take Democrats Seriously on Russia. Uh, and I went through the whole history of the Obama years um, in just continual appeasement to the Russians. Um, and there's actually a lot of disturbing, disturbing continuations from the Obama administration into Trump that neither side would willingly admit. I think both um, want to reduce America's role in the world. Obama kind of dressed it up in this very kind of, you know, gauzy talk of, of you know, world peace and all countries working together. and you know, he did it in a very kind of left-wing version, kind of universalist language, and, it was all, and, and Trump does it in a very belligerent America first language, but the outcome is America not throwing its weight around like it used to. So there's a lot of, con there's, there is continuity, I, I grant you that. And yes, Donald Trump has not been as bad on Europe or Russia. In fact, the Russia policy is tougher now. The American government's Russia policy is tougher, toward, is tougher towards the Russians than it was under Barack Obama. That's not because, but in spite of Donald Trump. Donald Trump was basically, the only legislation that Donald Trump has signed in his 10 months of being president was this, this Russia sanctions bill, which was pretty much forced upon him. And I think the only reason why he signed it was because there's this investigation going on and there's a cloud over him and he's been boxed in by this public perception that he's too close to the Russians. So he has to kind of maybe overcompensate a little. But absolutely on NATO, um, uh, it took him four months to endorse Article 5 of NATO, the Collective Defense Clause, which I can tell you had a lot of Europeans frightened. The message that it sends to the Russians when the United States won't explicitly say we will defend our allies if they're attacked, it's not a good message. He did come around to saying it, but you know, as far as NATO, the day-to-day -day operations are concerned, you know, there's a Eastern European Reassurance Initiative where we have uh, rotations of soldiers circulating through Poland and the Baltic states um, to, you know, basically reassure them in the, because they've been obviously very upset and afraid by what's been going on in Ukraine. That's been, that's been going on, that's been continuing. Um, so yes, I mean, there, look, I, 
my uh, conclusions about Donald Trump were formed by what he said on the campaign trail and the policies that he was advocating, which were really frightening and horrible. Um, but as president, I think we've seen that there's a big gulf between the rhetoric and the actual day-to-day -day functions of the government. I think part of the reason is for this is because he's actually made some good appointments. Um, and there just isn't, um, there aren't that many people to staff, there aren't that many America Firsters to staff an administration with. There just isn't the kind of intellectual bureaucratic apparatus of, you know, at, at think tanks, like you have, a, you know, Brookings or AEI or any, there just aren't that many people that you can put into government to carry out these policies. So I think, again, it's, all this is in spite of Donald Trump, I don't think, not, not because of him. Um, as for the EU, you know, it's not a perfect institution, but I'll just, you know, paraphrase Winston Churchill, it's the, it's the worst possible arrangement for Europe, but it's better than all the alternatives. There are, there's debate, they're both dead, and I'm not gonna presume to speak for, uh, <laughs> for dead people. I will add that, you know, Margaret Thatcher was an early supporter of uh, British membership in the, uh, in the European economic community, which was the predecessor. She also famously uh, said that referendums are the tools of dictators and demagogues. So I would like to think that she would have opposed the Brexit referendum. I think um, of all the things, first of all, I'm just, you know, generally, I, I generally don't like referendums. I think we elect people to Congress or to State House or, you know, we elect people to do that job for us. I don't, I don't like putting things up to a plebiscite. <laughs> particularly something as complex and complicated uh, as membership in a supranational institution that touches upon everything from, you know, fisheries laws to trade to, you know, all these things. It's a very complicated thing, this, this EU. And I think you're, you're seeing what a bad decision this was or what a mistake this was to have a referendum in the fact that the majority of parliamentarians, of British parliamentarians, even in the Tory party, where more of the voters oppose membership in the EU, the majority of parliamentarians oppose leaving the EU. Because they know what they're talking about. These people, it's their job to go to parliament every day and to study this issue. And they frankly, this might sound, you know, uh, coastal elitist, but you know, I trust the judgments of, of these people, of people whose job it is to govern than just the average Joe on the street. And you know there are people who will uh, beg to differ on that, but I think on something so complex as membership in the European Union, I don't think that's, some, that's, the, that's the sort of thing that should be put up to a plebiscite. And finally, on um, the issue of Islam in Europe, this is a huge topic, it's, it's, there's many facets to it, but I think we need to distinguish between those who tackle this issue responsibly and those who demagogue it. And I think there's a distinction to be had between People like Geert Wilders who say that the Quran should be banned and that people shouldn't be allowed to build mosques. Um, there's a distinction to be had between that and more reasonable leaders like the Prime Minister of the Netherlands who um, says, look, these are the values of my country. If you don't like them, leave. I support, I support the latter. I, I, I support defining a Europe of common values and saying, look, these are our values. If you subscribe to them, you're welcome to become a citizen and participate in our life. It doesn't matter what religion you are. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I, don't, um, I don't think it's a good idea to, to demagogue this issue and, and, and to conflate Islamism uh, and Islamic terrorism with Islam itself. I think that just exacerbates the problem. And that's what, frankly, the, you know, what ISIS wants, is they want to drive this division between mainstream European and American societies and their Muslim communities to put us at odds with our, with our Muslim neighbors so that um, uh, Muslim communities feel that they are oppressed and that they are being surveilled and that they are um, you know, put into this corner and that will make them more conducive for re recruitment to terrorist organizations. Yes. So I see you sort of you advocating for a sort of a, a, a revisiting or update on sort of the post-war Atlantic alliance. Um, and I wonder if there are, not that, not that I don't see that as possible, but if it wasn't possible, what is the alternative that isn't the sort of haze of everyone's the same in terms of, uh, you know, all governments are the same, they're corrupt, they're kleptocratic. What is the, what is the new, what is the, not the updated version of the post-war Atlantic Alliance, but sort of the new project? for the 21st century, I mean, one that takes into account right. sort of the necessity of dealing with asymmetric sure. warfare and, and, you know, 
uh, integration, whether you like it or not, and things like that. I mean, there's going to have to, I, yeah. I mean, I, I approach, I, I support. Um, uh, if we're, if we're going to integrate Russia and China and other quasi-authoritarian countries into our, you know, networks and our systems, we have to make sure that we're not diluting our own values and our own laws and our own <coughs> traditions and customs. Um, and I think there's a real threat of that of that happening. Um, I mean, if you just look at these attempts by the Russians, they their long-term strategic security goal is to get rid of NATO and to replace it with a security institution that stretches from, you know, they say from from Portugal to Vladivostok. You know, what's missing there is the United States. Um, and so there's all these attempts. Um, so, you know, the, the Chinese, the Chinese don't respect the freedom of the seas in the South China Sea. They, they are constantly, you know, building islands that didn't exist before in the middle of the ocean so that they can then claim international waters as their own. And we can't allow that to proceed because we have very, just like we can't allow what the Russians did in Crimea. We can't recognize that. We can never, ever say uh, that, or that, what, what the, what the, that the annexation of Crimea is a fait accompli and that this is just, we're just going to have to deal with this. Um, this is the most fundamental sacrosanct principle in international law is that countries can't gobble up the territories of other countries. And I'll say that the means, the, the rationale that the Russians used for what they did in Crimea is the same exact rationale that Adolf Hitler used in taking over the Sudetenland, which is my you know, ethnic brethren in another country are being oppressed by whomever, and so I need to go in with my military forces and, t and annex that territory and make it part of Germany. That's exactly what the Russians, what Putin did. He invented these claims that Russian speakers were being, you know, not, they, weren't, they weren't allowed to speak the Russian language and they're being slaughtered in the streets by Ukrainian Nazis and so we need to go in and the same exact rationale. So that, that can never be recognized. And some people say, well, you know, it's, it's just gone, forget it, the Russians are going to be in possession of Crimea forever. Well, you know what, people said the same thing about the Soviet Union. And they said the same thing about the Baltic states. And we never extended recognition to the Baltic the socialist republics. We never sent ambassadors. We, we had a policy for 50 years that said we're not going to recognize it. And I'm sure there were people who, in, you know, in the, in the 1970s who said, look, it's been 25 years that the Baltic states have been occupied by the Soviets. It's just enough already. Let's just, let's just recognize it. Let's just get on with, with this thing. We didn't do that. And we won in the end. And so I think it's very important that these, you know, these fundamental values of the international system be observed and protected, and we can't allow those who would try to undermine them and, and degrade them to, to win and to succeed. Yeah. Sir? I suggest that Russia, Russia is heading on in a direction that will work, their economy is falling apart. What will it take to have an implosion in the Soviet Union? Russia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Russia. <laughs> I don't think, I don't want that to happen. I don't, th I don't think we want there to be a, an implosion. I think we would like a some form of democratic transition. I think it's going to be very difficult. I mean, you know, we tried it in the 90s and it didn't really, didn't really work. Um, so I think we should do what we can to avoid a, you know, a catastrophic uh, implosion. That doesn't mean that we should let up on the sanctions and whatnot. We should try to convince the Russians that it's in their best interest to, you know, stop disrupting the international order as they have. But uh, um, an implosion would, would not be good. Having people rioting on the streets and you know storming the Kremlin, I'm not sure that's... Revolutions tend not to work out well. Ours was one of the exceptions. Uh, very rarely do, do revolutions ever, ever end up with a happy ending. Yeah. Yeah, oh, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, like Professor Kaufman, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but I, I don't... I find myself convinced about what you say about the Islam and European identity sort of issue. I think you seem sort of dismissive about it. Um, well, for instance, you said, you, you mentioned that the gap between, you know, the elites yeah. and the people who are really afraid of, of more Muslim immigration. Yeah. And, and I thought you were going to say, gee, isn't it that worrisome that the elites are so unresponsive to the concerns of the people? But instead it was like, gee, aren't Look at the people failing to live up to their. Oh no no! Well, I think we need to meet them halfway. Okay. I wouldn't. I mean, I would not support banning Muslim immigration, mm -hmm. but there's going to have to be some concessions to this. There's going to have to be some reduction. Mm 
serious, uh, yeah, abs absolutely. So one of the things you said that I think response to Professor Kaufman was, any, anybody can live here, any religion, as long as they accept their values. It seems like an implicit assumption there is uh, all religions are compatible with their values, right? Well, I mean, Islam is a religion of 1.6 billion people. And uh, look, the, the Saudi form of it, or the Iranian form of it, is absolutely not compatible with Western values. But that doesn't mean that a person from Saudi Arabia or Pakistan can't come to a Western country and become a small l classical liberal. I think that... Sure, and I... Yeah, well, that's why I, I, in the book, which I hope you'll buy for 28, $28.95, uh, I'm, I'm very critical of Chancellor Merkel's um, decision in 2015. I thought it was, for a variety of reasons, I thought it was a mistake. Um, and, I, and I think that most Europeans have come around to that view as well. Yeah. Yeah, I just... Um I just wanted to point out a, what I think is a glaring contradiction in what you're talking about. You just touched on the South China Sea, China freedom of the seas, and you touched on Crimea yep. and Putin. Both of those things, I believe, happened under the previous president's yep. regime. Sure. So uh, there's no tie-in with Trump at all. This is on Obama. Yeah, and, I, I, and I, you didn't really make that connection. No, no, all. absolutely. Uh, so I think you really need to emphasize that. I mean, those are failures of Obama. Absolutely, no. I, and I, I'll refer you again to the two articles. One was why it's hard to take Democrats serious on Russia, and I, and I wrote another one. The title was um, "Who's Who Destroyed the Liberal World Order," and it was about um, all. You know, it was, I was looking at Obama officials who are now constantly tweeting and going on television complaining about how Donald Trump is you know, destroying the liberal world order. And I point out and I say, look, you know, it was Barack Obama who, less than six months after the Russians invaded and occupied Georgia, which people forget about this in 2008, said, you know what, not only are we not gonna punish Russia for this, we're gonna reward them with a reset. And we're gonna get rid of these um, missile defense systems in Poland and the Czech Republic, and we're gonna negotiate this new START treaty it's really not in our interest, but the Russians want it, so we're going to do it. Um, so no, I am, I'm an unsparing critic of Barack Obama. I just think it's in the past, and it's not really worth talking about um, to the extent that we need to talk about the present. And, you know, on Crimea, I mean, it was Donald Trump. Say what you will about Barack Obama. It was Barack Obama did uh, institute um, sanctions on the Russians after what they did in Russia, where it was Donald Trump who, at least during the campaign, when asked about this question, said, well, you know, maybe the Crimeans want to be Russians, and maybe we should just recognize it and lift the sanctions. So there is a, fun, there is a is, is, as much as I would criticize Barack Obama, there, there is still a degree of difference between him and at least rhetorically where, Don, where Donald Trump is on all these issues. I mean, Don, Barack Obama was soft on Russia, but he never expressed any admiration for Vladimir Putin. Donald Trump is the most pro-Russian American presidential candidate since Henry Wallace in 1948, okay, who was a, who was a communist fellow traveler. I mean, really, I mean, it, and for him to be a Republican is even more weird, frankly. So, um, look, this country has a, we have a bipartisan Russia problem. We have a Republican president who seems to think that this KGB thug is a friend of the United States and takes his word over that of the intelligence community of our own country about whether or not Russians meddled, this hardened KGB act, uh, uh, thug. He takes his word over that of the 17 intelligence agencies as to the question of whether or not they meddled in the election. We have a Republican president who has that, and we have Democrats, frankly, who are unwilling to reflect upon the previous president and the eight years of failed policies that he implemented. Um, I think the only people who really come out you know, shining on this are those few of us, like myself, who criticized both, who criticized Obama, who were loud and, loud and frequent critics of Obama during his presidency, and have been loud and frequent pres uh, critics of Donald Trump. Yes? Um, so it sounds like you're advocating for a U.S. that sort of throws its weight around a little bit more than it has in the past. Uh, but could you not argue that some of those policies that you might be advocating for uh, have been just as damaging if not more so to U.S. interests in the past, 
past than, say, taking a step back and reevaluating America's role in the world? I think what we saw with President Bush was perhaps a, um, we maybe went too far in one direction. And then with President Obama, there was a reaction that went too far in the other direction. And so we had a, we had a President Bush who, I don't wanna, I don't wanna relitigate the Iraq war here, but we had a, you know, we had a President Bush who was perhaps perceived by the American people as doing too much mil mil militarily. And then we had a, a reaction, an almost extreme reaction in the former Barack Obama who just didn't want to do anything. And we've seen the results, you know, in my opinion, I think we've seen the, the bad results of that. If you'll allow me to follow up, yeah. would you advocate for more application of soft power rather than military action? Well, I'm not calling for military action against Russia. I'm calling for a strong deterrence. And that's, and that's you know, that's, uh, no one is, and frequently when you, call for such things. The, the Russians love to use this word warmonger. They throw it around all the time. Donald Trump used it a lot during the last election in an, in, in an interesting synthesis of, of Russian propaganda narratives and the Trump campaign, frequently calling Hillary Clinton a warmonger, a word which I wrote a column about this a couple months ago. The word warmonger has a very ennoble lineage, lineage that it's been mostly used throughout history by fascists and communists. Um, and so I think we need to be very wary of uh, when we make arguments about, you know, for instance, sending troops to Poland and the Baltic states. The Russians get up in arms and say, oh, we're, you're provoking us. And there are many people in the West who say, this is warmongering, you're provoking the Russians. I'm sorry, Poland and the Baltic states are members of NATO and they're democratic countries. If they want American troops on their soil, then they have every right to be there. And that's not, you know, militarism, that's not warmongering, that's standing with our allies in the face of an aggressive bully which invades and occupies its neighbors. And I think the stronger we are, look, Putin only understands strength. Soft power is not gonna work on him, him and his regime. He only understands strength, which is why I think he held Obama in such contempt. During the election uh, meddling last year, Barack Obama, uh, he went up to Putin at a summit and he said, hey, Vlad, cut it out. Really, like that's gonna convince Vladimir Putin to stop doing whatever awful thing he's doing, the American president telling him to cut it out? Absurd. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the parts that you mentioned, the populist parties, uh, they, I think that they're all, like, if you mentioned right-wing ones, I was wondering if you had any, any like, quick thoughts Absolutely. on left-wing left populism. Absolutely. Um, both in the EU and the US. Um, In France, the Socialist Party uh, collapsed and we saw the rise of a man named Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who's like a neo-communist. This is, a, this is a, a, a worrying trend across the continent, is the decline of sort of mainstream social democratic parties on the center left, and they're being replaced, or their supporters are going to the far left and also the far right. And so in Spain, the socialist party has been declining while the, this new party called Podemos, which is a kind of Latin America, Chavista style movement in Greece, uh, PASOK, the Social Democratic Party, been wiped out. And now we have Syriza, which is a kind of neo post communist, whatever you want to call it. They're, they're the ones running the country. Um, and I would even say the Labour Party has been captured by uh, the extreme, extreme hard left. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn, who's the leader of the, of the Labour Party, um, is. Uh, just, a, just an extreme radical leftist, uh, hates America, uh, really despises NATO. Trump just doesn't like NATO because he thinks it's a ripoff to America. He doesn't, you know, he, he, he doesn't have a gut, visceral hatred to it. Corbyn is of the old Marxist, you know, Cold War style, fellow traveling left. Um, and it's really worrying that, that that is now in control of one of the world's once great social democratic parties, the Labour Party. And I think that the way things are going in Britain right now, the chaos because of Brexit and the internal fighting in the Tory party, which is a perennial issue with them, it is disturbingly likely that Jeremy Corbyn will become prime minister. Yes. Um, about Russia, what would you have the US do, okay, short of military aggression in terms of pushing back or deterrence or opposing or confronting Russia, indeed, to, to limit it, to, to I think we need, yeah, we need, we need to use more economic power. 
Uh, the Russians have invested lots of money in Russian oligarchs and Russian officials. They park their money in the West. Not, so, not as much in the U.S., but in the city of London and the French Riviera. I mean, it's all over the place. And we, you know, that, that was not um, something that happened really during the Soviet times. Um, and this has been a new way in which the Russians have been trying to exercise influence is spreading the money around. And I think that this, this is really one of the ways that one of the unlooked and um, methods by which we can absolutely punish the Russians more. We should be doing it anyway, irrespective of what they're doing. And seizing assets, absolutely. And making it more difficult for Russia to corrupt our systems. Paul Manafort is the perfect example of this. I mean, how is it that a guy can behave the way, I mean, just, you know, money laundering tens of millions of dollars, working on behalf of a Russian-controlled Ukrainian political party who gets to become a, a campaign manager for the president of the United States? I mean, that just shows you the extent in the, of the rot that it has come to this. And it's worse in other countries. You look at Gerhard Schroeder, the former Social Democratic Chancellor of Germany. I think like a month after leaving office in 2005, he joins the board of uh, Gazprom. And there's no shame in this. He's completely, he just, he, just a couple months ago, he joined the board of Rosneft, which is the, the oil uh, company. Um, so the, the Russian tentacles are, are really deep in some places. And, yeah. I mean, I think it's greed. It is greed. A lot of, of course it's greed. Of course it's greed. People are willing to put their economic or their personal, uh, you know, greediness above that of their national interests or the interests of their, of the West, of the, of the, of the, of the liberal Western political community. So that requires a, a bigger cultural um, Yes, it does. Change yes. In the West. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Kaufman gave a lecture some weeks ago in which he said the only way, uh, I hope I'm saying this properly, the only way to deal with our adversaries is to create fear yes. by having a very strong military uh, organization and being willing to use it if necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if what he would now say about some of these things in terms of Dealing with the Russians, with Trump, you mean, like the? No, well, well oh. dealing with Putin. What, what should Trump? Well, yeah, I don't, I don't think Vladimir Putin feared Barack Obama. No, no, he didn't. He I, didn't. Nobody feared Pro Pro Barack right. Obama because he had no leadership. Skills. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I would agree. Yes, ma'am. Well, I wondered if you'd make a remark about demographics because we know that so many of European countries are. Our uh, have birth rates, yeah. low replacement rate, yeah. and I believe this, the Russians do too. I know that yes. their public health status is very bad. So, uh, can you comment on how you see these things playing out in the coming decades? Yeah, it's um, it's a problem, and it varies from country to country, but it's pretty much uniform across the EU uh, that the birth rates are at below replacement rate, which to me is a sign of real lack of civilizational confidence. I mean, if you know, you're not. Having lots of children shows that you're uh, optimistic about the future. And so, you know, a country like Israel, for all the uh, dangerous environment that it's in, among the secular, I'm not talking about the religious Jews who have tons of children, among the secular Jews of Israel, the birth rate is almost is three ch children per woman. So that shows you that there's a lot of, you know, optimism in that country, despite all the stuff they have to deal with in that neighborhood. But in, and so it really, it does, it does speak to something fundamental about Europe that they're not reproducing. And you know, I'm not a philosopher and I, and I don't really get into that question in the book. Um, but that, 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 that is a sort of haunting statistic. Yes, uh, I want to take someone who hasn't asked a question yet. Uh, the cameraman. Hi, uh, so <clears throat> a couple of things. So I'm wondering, when you talk about Putin, do we equate Putin and Russia? Or right. do we look at Putin as an individual right. like we look at Trump? For instance, if, if Russia were to impose sanctions against us, right. that's not going to hurt Donald Trump. Right. But so how do we deal with the fact that, that our leaders do not represent us as a country? Right. They are off on their own. They're making multinational deals. They don't give a damn about foreign policy. They really are operating at a much higher level, as are corporations like the oil companies. Sure. I mean, I would distinguish between Donald Trump, who was democratically elected, 
um, and Vladimir Putin, who um, w would would win a real fair, free and fair election. He, he, he doesn't have to rig them, and he, but the conditions in Russia are such that it's not really fair to say that he's a democratically elected leader because he controls all the television stations. He imprisons his opponents. There's a culture of fear if you criticize him, so I'm not going to call him a democratic leader. Now, the extent to which the Russian people support him is up for debate. Um, there are polls that you know, cite 85% you know, of Russians support Vladimir Putin. I am always skeptical of polls in undemocratic countries because imagine you're sitting in your apartment in Moscow and someone just calls you on the phone and says, do you like the president? You, know, you're, you can't really trust the results of those sorts of polls. So I wouldn't put his popularity at 85%, but it's certainly you know, in the 60s probably. He's, he's a legitimately, genuinely popular leader. He's not like Mugabe, who apparently uh, was not popular at all because no one protested at all. The army just came in and took him away. And, no one, and I, I was actually kind of surprised by that. I've been to Zimbabwe, and I, I thought he had a real, a real support base. Maybe not the majority of the country, but certainly a lot of people, and apparently not, because they're not, they don't miss him um, <laughs> for, 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 for good reason. Um, but yes, and I think what we need to do when we're crafting policies towards Russia is we have to distinguish between the regime and the Russian people. Um, I have a friend who's a very brave Russian dissident. You might have heard of him. He's, the, he's been... Um, poisoned twice. You've probably seen him on television. And um, Vladimir Karamurza. And he constantly, whenever I say, you know, it's Russia that's doing this, or it's Russians who's doing this, he says, no, it's Putin. It's the Putin government, it's the Putin regime. You can't, you know, uh, cast everyone as being responsible for this. And so as Americans, and as an American government, we need to convey to the Russian people to the extent that, that we can, that the sanctions are not being imposed on you as individuals. They're targeting for instance, there's this very famous law, the Magnitsky Act, which is named after a, a Russian lawyer who was killed by the Russian government, uh, or probably killed by the Russian government, after exposing a massive fraud scheme. And his name has now been used uh, to, uh, for a law called the Magnitsky Act, which puts, which puts um, uh, penalties and sanctions and visa bans and all this stuff on Russian officials who are abusers of human rights. And it came up in the presidential campaign because it was this law that this crazy, that this weird Russian lawyer wanted to meet with Donald Trump Jr. to get the Trump administration, if they were elected, to re repeal. The Russian government portrays this law, which targets a couple dozen leaders and individuals. They portray this law as an anti-Russian law. It's actually, my friend Vladimir says, it's the most pro-Russian law imaginable because it targets the, the oppressors and the thieves who run, who run, the, who run Russia and to our oppressing the Russian people. And so we need to make very clear when, you know, in, our, in our overtures that we are not, you know, we have no beef, we have no problem with, with the Russian people. It's with the regime that rules them. Yes. Early, your early comments were about um, the threat of disintegration, I think. Yeah. The EU coming apart, NATO coming apart, the US being separated. Um, I think you can make an argument that there's an underlying force that's, that's perhaps fundamental to making that problem bigger and bigger. And, and it's not just the disintegration at that level. The U.S. seems to be mm -hmm. disintegrating. There's different races, yep. different sects, yep. different religions. Yep. And it's enabled, it seems to me, by fundamentally by um, making the notion of truth go away. And it's enabled fundamentally by the internet and all of the tools yeah. on the internet, able to target tiny little yes. microcosms and letting them and feeding them whatever they may wish to hear. Yeah. And on the other side of that same coin, self individual self selecting whatever it is they yeah. wish to uh, read or mm -hmm. or listen to. So with all of that said. Yeah. I don't see that trend, if, that, if you think yeah. that's valid, yeah. that trend seems like it will only get worse as technology <clears throat> advances, not get better. No, it's really frightening. I mean, uh, when the internet first started, you know, we had all these optimistic assumptions and it was giving voice to new people. And it's true. It, you know, there are people who, people who could start blogs and websites who before would not have had a voice. It's also given voice to a lot of nasty, awful people too. 
And the other thing it's done is we've seen, not only with the rise of the internet, the, the collapse of the, of the mainstream institutional media. And it used to be that there were gatekeepers. And you, know, you could say that in the era of just the three networks and the New York Times and the Washington Post and a couple of other newspapers that it was, you know, it was, the debate was too limited and whatnot. Um, but there was a kind of, kind of civic responsibility that would keep out certain views that were perhaps too extreme. You know, I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, I think it's abhorrent that a man like Alex Jones has the ear of the President of the United States. That horrifies me. That this guy who just a couple of years ago was an obscure conspiratorial radio host in Texas is now, you know, has tens of millions of listeners across the United States and is able to project his, you know, vile filth because of the internet and because of Twitter. And there's so many other people who can do this. And we have, um, yeah, I mean, it's a really, it's a real problem and I don't have a solution to it. Yeah, uh, you, yeah, oh, sir, no, you in the back. Um, that's kind of coming off his disintegration question a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me, but you know, we've seen like the shocking rise of like Southern nationalists and American neo-Nazis. Um, but I was wondering if you would comment on because there's been a debate on it about the American far left as well, mm -hmm. the rise of these fascist groups. Obviously, Donald Trump said that there were some bad people there, and I know that there's been some debate on that. But is the far left and the far right in this country equally dangerous? Is that something we even have to worry about? Or? I mean, just looking at the statistics that from law enforcement and the FBI, the far right is significantly more you know dangerous. And just you just look at the you know incidents of violence and criminality. Um, but I wonder under, I, I fear that under um, Donald Trump and some of the rhetoric that's being put out there by mainstream liberals, you know, talking about calling Trump a fascist, saying that he's Ill illegitimate. Um, I don't like the guy, I think, as you can tell, but I think we have to be able to distinguish between, you know, Hitler and Donald Trump. Because if he is Hitler, you're not going to defeat Hitler by... Uh, the, the filibuster and wearing pussy hats. <laughs> That's not how you defeated Hitler. You defeated Hitler with, you know, the Red Army and the RAF and lots of bombs. And I think the more that this sort of rhetoric becomes normalized, you are giving license to people to commit violence. Um, if people really genuinely believe that they are living in a country that's descending into fascism, I mean, how would you respond? What is a responsible person supposed to do if they're living in Weimar, Germany? It's to take up arms against, uh, or Hitlerite Germany. It's not to protest peacefully. It's to do something really extreme and radical. And we're not there. We're not even close to that. Um, and so I really think it's incumbent upon people to be careful in the rhetoric and the language and the tactics that they use in you know, resisting. I hate this term, resistance. I'm sorry, unless you're like burying weapons in the woods of Poland or living in the basement of a French country house, you don't get to call yourself the resistance, OK? We need an opposition, not a resistance. Yeah, yes. Well, that last comment you made um, was a little disturbing to me because Hitler was not Hitler originally either. So he was. You can read Mein Kampf. No, you can no, read no, Mein Kampf, and he was very clear. Well, but people voted for him. <laughs> they did. And, yeah, but Donald he, Trump never said that he wants to exterminate, you know. He said he, want, he is threatening the news media. He's threatening voting rights. He's threatening a lot of stuff, but I have to say, I'm, I, and I'm, and I look, I, I was a vociferous opponent of Donald Trump. I spent basically all of 2016 writing articles denouncing this man. I've been impressed by the American system. He has not done. He has not been able to violate the Constitution. He has not been able to shut down the news media. He's he's been impotent on a lot of things. Look, Donald Trump isn't a fascist. He's a golfer. Okay. And it's, it's really unfair, it's actually unfair to compare him to a fascist, because fascists get things done. And this guy can't even get, a, this guy can't even get bills passed through Congress. He wasn't. Donald Trump's 71 years old. And I just, look, I, we have to be aware, we have to be vigilant, and I think the American people are. I think the media is doing a good job. I mean, they're, they're covering him. Oftentimes, I think they're, they're often unfair. And that, that they look at every little thing. Some of, sometimes he does things that aren't controversial or they shouldn't be controversial and they're, they're blown up. So, I mean, the media is, believe me, the media is on the job, okay? The Democratic Party is 
on the job. The civil society in this country, they're on, they're on the job. I'm not, I'm not worried about us descending into, into tyranny. Okay, but one, just one more sure. follow. Um, his supporters, who were very anti-Putin uh, a year ago, two years yeah, ago, yeah, yeah. are now, if you, if you read the polls, Absolutely. they are heavily, yeah, heavily yeah, yeah. I've, favoring Putin and yes. his operation. Yeah, I've written extensively about this. Uh, I've, I've written, it's one of the more um, astounding and worrying political transformations of the past couple of years has been that of conservatives and Republicans becoming pro-Russia. Yeah. Yes? I would remind you that Carter kissed President. And if when, when Trump kisses Putin, I will believe that he's <laughs> That's true. That is true. I think that's a, that's a kind of Russian tradition, isn't it? Thank you. Okay. <laughs>